Yeah, yeah. We're thinking co- like English countryside. Yeah, like Worcester or something, which is <laughs> yeah. not the sauce, the village. I don't even know if it's a village. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Cloud Machine Podcast. My name is Matt Landry. And in this 46th episode, I'm here with Matthias the Fourth. Woo! Throughout the podcast, we discuss his origin story, writing pop music, becoming a solo artist, traveling to write music with friends, and a lot more. We also play the producer's game. Thanks for listening. That was clean. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, for those who are new to the podcast, Cloud Machine is about the music industry and its stakeholders, meaning everyone that works in it lives it loves it, and surrounds it. Our goal is to shine a light on roles, people, and realities of the music industry that are often forgotten or taken for granted. Whether you're someone that's dreaming about making a move in the industry, have some songs recorded and don't know what to do with them, or just a listener that wants to learn more, you're at the right place. This week, I have the immense pleasure of welcoming a friend uh, to the podcast. I've gotten to know Matthias uh, through my music friends here, a circle here in Toronto, um, through Elio uh, Valley that crew and uh now after a few years we've also traveled together um yes i had some of my favorite nights favorite meals specifically uh, with with matthias <laughs> the memories <laughs> and um i'm just uh, stoked to have him on the pod it's uh we're due for a conversation here we are how are yeah, you i'm great how are you <laughs> i'm good i'm excited to be on a podcast yeah I've always, yeah I've always wanted to be on one <laughs> yeah we, every time over the past year that i've gone to your place you're like you're listening to a podcast, or you're, you're you're doing something. It's true. Um, and uh, no, it's 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 great to have you on. Let's start the pod. Um, how we always start the pod by asking you your favorite experience as a fan going to a live concert. Oh, okay. Um, my fa- like my favorite live show. Or yeah, that you my favorite to. experience. Ah, well, experience or live show. Hmm. I think the one of the most memorable ones was my first arena show. Yeah. And it was Lil Wayne <laughs> in <Yeah>. Ottawa. <laughs> and the opener was Rick Ross and Far East Movement when they had the Fly Like a G6 song. Yeah. Um, I think that was a very pivotal moment in my musical journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't the best show I've ever seen, but it was <laughs> sure. the most memorable. Um, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Were you um, a Lil Wayne fan? Like a big Lil Wayne fan? In high school, yeah. I was... Yeah. I was, Same a, I was a rap guy. Yeah, I was. Uh, I thought I was going to be a rapper myself. Actually, at one okay. point, that's it's a, never too late. <laughs> it's a cloud machine exclusive. Yeah, that's right. There's yes. A, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> great. Are there other? Are, are there more? Is that the only one that you'd highlight in your uh, um, your show going career? That's the biggest highlight. I think all the other shows are just good shows I've seen. Like I saw <laughs> Ben Howard. I love that. I always loved the 1975 shows. Yes. Um, Charlie sh- at Charlie XX's show at Massey Hall was really sick. Yeah. Um, but the Lil Wayne one was like a musical awakening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, next question, a new question we asked last week, but the second time it's asked, is there a project that you've contributed to so far that would best represent your work? So for the people that are just discovering you through listening to the pod, uh, is there something that they should go check out um, or a project that you just like to highlight in, in your, your um, work? Yeah, I mean, I guess there would be two. There's my EP Fanboy that I put out last year that I guess for my solo stuff is the best representation at the moment. Yeah. And then Valley's album Lost in Translation that came out in June. Um, I was uh, I had the pleasure to be a part of that. And yeah. I write a few songs on the album and I really love how that album turned out as a whole. So. I would say go listen to Valley. <laughs> go and I had shameless fan. promo. Yeah. I'm not even getting paid to do that. Yeah. And fanboy, uh, and fanboy, yeah. 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 Dice's EP. Are you working on new stuff right now? You just put out a single called Breakfast. I did. Yeah. Uh, I'm. Yeah, I am working on new stuff. I think I want to do an EP. I'm kind of. I've like really been into the songwriter producer thing the last year or so. Yeah. So my solo music has been more of a fun side project. Um, so I'm working on EP. I don't really know exactly what I'm going to do yet, Yeah, but there's always songs being made. So there you go. Keep an eye out. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, going into the second sort of more music business sort of topic. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, we take a look at Erica Badu's quote, which is 
music and music business are two different things. Yeah. So just very general quote here. Um, I know recently you've also, I, I, I forget what it was, but you were speaking about the music business on your Instagram story recently. Yes. Um, TED Talk. Yeah, your TED Talk. Yes, that's right. Yes. And um, as, as we're speaking today, this comes out next week, but um, the Spotify wrapped yeah. and all that stuff came out last uh, yesterday. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts, the first instincts when you, you, when you, when you hear music and music business are two different things here? Yeah. I mean, I, they are, but they're also very intertwined. I think yep. at the professional level, they go hand in hand, mm -hmm. um, cause the music isn't anything without the business side of things. Um, I think there's a level where music is, can just be fun and, and you can just have fun making music or listening to music, but for a career, the business part is extremely important, and I think they're kind of go hand in hand in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm still learning a lot about the business and sort of still figuring out how to make a living off of it. Um, and I've been making music for almost, I think, 10 years now. So I think yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's also always changing. I feel like we're in, a, in an era where everything's changing every week. There's new, like, things you should be doing, especially as an artist, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Short form video content has become a huge thing. Um and streaming is always changing, so I feel like being on top of that is is crucial, but um don't know where I'm going with my answer. <laughs> no, but so <laughs> <laughs> It's my first podcast, yeah, guys. Yeah. Give me a second. So I need to warm up. How 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 would you as an artist or how are you doing like staying on top of those like sorts of things? Like are there things that you're doing to just like be in the know of certain trends that are happening or is it just like as a consumer as a as a as a consumer of the mediums like just I, being like yeah. i see this i gotta do this as well i'm flying by the seat of my pants yeah for sure mm -hmm. um i mean i'm learning a lot from my friends and the more you kind of get into the more professional side of things it's a pretty small world so there's a lot of people that you meet and that you can learn from and talk to and stuff yeah but as far as you know the best practices i feel like it's always changing and i'm still Figuring it out as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, the grant system in Canada is great, which helps a lot. Yes, yeah. Um, but I feel like there's also so many avenues where you can make money off music that aren't really that common. I mean, there's sync and there's streaming, but streaming doesn't pay a lot. So I'm still figuring it out, honestly. Yeah, I feel yeah. like I'm no, uh, I'm no expert. Um, where do you think the music industry is going? Like you, you, you there's yes, it's changing every week. Do you, do you feel like there's like a, a straight path for where it's going? Um, are you seeing things currently that are like more interesting to you? Um, stuff like um, that. I have no idea personally where it's going. I think there's a lot of power in the hands of the creators nowadays. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think it's becoming a very DIY, not DIY is not the right word, but I think individuals can have a, a big impact on the industry nowadays if you know what you're doing and if you can put a little team together yourself you have the ability with your phone and with the internet and stuff to be your own label at this point yeah yeah, yeah. um which is great but it also means that you have an incredible amount of work to do and wearing many different hats before you get any like recognition from major labels who could back you and get you on radio and all that kind of stuff so um I have no idea where it's going. It's yeah, exciting, yeah. but it's also, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I feel like I can hardly keep up with everything nowadays. Totally. Like I'm still figuring out the TikTok thing, and I feel like that's been going on for like four years now <laughs> yeah, or something yeah. like that. So Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot I, of catching up. Yeah, I still I still feel like the TikTok is like the new lingo, but it's, I know. it's been it's, it's been, been around. I wonder what's next, like what's going to come after TikTok, because I feel like they've hacked our brains with that app and i i don't know how much more addictive and like yeah time consuming it can get because yeah. that one even unintentionally i'm just like yeah I wake up and i'm on it and i'm like i don't even want to be on here but i'm still on it yeah um and and with tiktok it was like yeah you you were saying like even like short form video but i don't know what's after that is it more like yeah because vine was short form video like but maybe TikTok holograms and stuff you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly like, no exactly flying cars yeah <laughs> Um, moving on to the, uh, the origin story here. Yes. Um, can you give me a lowdown on, on, on the Matisse origin story? Yes. Um, 
I, I feel like you, you have one of the more interesting origin stories. Uh, a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, no, I was born in the Netherlands, yep. hence the name, which is pretty much the Dutch version of, of Matthew. So we kind of have the same name. Um, I was born in the Netherlands. I grew up there with my parents, obviously. Uh, that's how I was born. <laughs> um, and then I moved to Canada when I was 12. Yeah. Um, I moved to a very small town near Brockville, Ontario, if anybody knows that place. Uh, and then I ended up moving to Mississauga for school. There you go. That's where I met a lot of my current friends. And then I ended up in Toronto. Um, but yeah, Netherlands, small town, Ontario, Mississauga, yeah, yeah. Toronto. It's kind of the trajectory. How, 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 how do, do you think that has had an impact on like your your music output? Like your just your process or uh I th- I think yeah, probably subconsciously. I feel like the music I listened to growing up that my parents played definitely had an impact on my current music tastes yeah, and like yeah. what I'm doing. Um country is huge right now and I grew up in small town Ontario, so I kinda wish that had a bigger impact on me as far as making really good country music. Yeah. Cause I feel like if I was in that lane, maybe I would uh know more about the music business. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's definitely influenced me. I don't know anything specific that's like that I heard or that was played when I was like young that really impacted who I am. But mm-hmm. I think it was all subconscious. Yeah. yeah. Were your parents creative? Uh, yeah, they they love music. They're like big music fans. And yeah, I was always playing music around the house. He played guitar and like taught me my first guitar chords. Nice. My grandma was a professional opera singer, so that's okay. She's wow. like the only other professional musician in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she started pretty late and did it until I think like a few years ago. She's in her eighties now, but wow, yeah, she was singing, uh, singing opera in Europe. Yeah, in like Netherlands and Germany and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. It's pretty cool. Have you uh, uh, had you ever gone to a performance? I did. Yeah, she did like Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, uh, yeah. like opera thing. Okay. Um, I wish that I was more mature when I went to these shows because I was a little bit bored. Right. Which I hate to say because now I would really appreciate watching those performances, but mm-hmm. I was I was a lot younger. So I was like, I mean, I appreciated the talent and the, how amazing it was that my grandma was, you know, singing opera, but it wasn't my, like, musical s- taste at the, at that time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, why is this show three hours long? But <laughs> uh, no, it was great. She's And she would always sing around the house when I was, like, staying over at their place. And it was always like very impressive, just because the vocals and like the projection of opera singers is yeah, insane. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I love that. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And what kind of music were your parents listening to, like growing up? Um, a lot of different things. Jamiroquai, I remember, was oh, a yeah. big one. Super Tramp was a big one. Yeah. Um, one of my f- first. I'm going off on a tangent. Can we no, go please. Off on yeah. Tangents? One of my first like musical memories that's not like a show or a concert uh i got a little like stereo system for my my room and that was like the first big piece of technology i could have in my room yeah, yeah. i always wanted a tv but that wasn't allowed um i got this stereo system thing and it had a cassette player and i remember i got a super tramp cassette yeah for my dad's cassette collection i guess and i would just listen to that like breakfast in america maybe that's yes. why i made a song called breakfast but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd listen. So the Super Tramp is actually a big, actually probably one of my early music memories. Just oh, okay. Having one cassette and playing it forever. Yeah until, yeah. until I got access to the internet and started downloading Lil Wayne. <laughs> 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 the Carter uh, 2 or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, any other influences, like, except Super Tramp? Like, do you remember, like, the first, like, uh, like song you learned on guitar or something like that? Or... Anything? Um, I know Robbie Williams was a big one, but he oh, never yeah. really broke through in North America. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the Beatles, ACDC. Yeah. I was a huge ACDC fan. There you go. Um, and I really want, I went to like a, I think it was Catholic or a Christian school yep. in the Netherlands, and they had a talent show. And I insisted on doing Highway to Hell by ACDC. <laughs> yeah. I didn't end up doing it, obviously, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. my parents were like, maybe that's not a good idea. But <laughs> I wanted the Angus Young like school uniform. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to. I wanted to do that, and I didn't see why that was a problem <laughs> at a Catholic school. But yeah, yeah uh, ACC, uh, Rage Against the Machine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tom Morello. Yeah, Battle. a lot of stuff too. I don't exactly because I didn't speak English yet, so. We would be listening to a lot of my dad would make like CD mixes yeah. in the car and we would just be listening to music. So there's a lot of songs that I'll 
remember and be like, oh my God, the memories, my childhood that I don't know the title of or the artist's name of because I was just sitting in the back seat, like hearing it, but I wasn't right. I wasn't reading the track list or seeing totally. what the song titles were. So a lot of the stuff is somewhere in my brain, but I wouldn't be able to name it, unfortunately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, in high school, w- was there a cult? Was there like an arts culture, arts scene? Did you take like some like specialized music classes? Uh, Stuff n- like that. No, because I mean, the, sc- the high school I went to had three hundred kids. Yeah, so right it here. was like tiny. Yeah, there was tractors in the parking lot, and it was just rural. Um, there was, I don't think there was. I mean, we had some band. Like I played bass in a band in high school. Yeah, um, and. Then I started rapping and handing out mixtapes in the hallway, which I think, I don't think there was any competition as far as rap in my high school, <laughs> yeah. which is great for me, um, <laughs> speaking of music business. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's, my, my mixtape was in the yearbook. <laughs> that's, of like, that's and my fantastic. rap name was Dutch, which was not very creative, but um, there's like Dutch releases his new mixtape it's called planet mind i can't find it on the internet i don't know where it went (laughs) it's out there um but yeah i don't there was not much there's like we had like arts class and stuff yeah yeah yeah. um and we would do like coffee house things yeah sure um but it wasn't like i think it was just very rural and small so it wasn't really there wasn't that much music from what i can remember yeah yeah how were you handing out that mixtape like, just, was it like a like just straight like burn CDs? Oh, burn CDs. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I think I made it in in Comtech class, okay. which is like the class where you get to make videos and stickers and stuff. So yeah. I just make stickers, and I think I made the mixtape cover. I can't remember if I like made the actual sleeves for it or if I ordered those. But yeah, I was just like I would give them to people. <laughs> I probably gave out like six maybe it's to fun. my friends. <laughs> it's fantastic, and it was in the yearbook, so it made it. It's true, it made it. I peaked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, when did things like start changing for you? Because you went to you went to Metalworks. I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, how was that influence? And what was the what was like the decision there or the transition between like high school, going from uh like a more of a rural community to like mm-hmm. an audio school. Yeah, I mean, Metalworks was kind of a last minute thing because I got to the end of high school and I didn't really plan make any plans. So I was like, oh no, I have to apply for universities and stuff. Right. And I was like, I'll do film. Um, and then I applied and I had to make like a portfolio or like a, a video kind of showcasing my ability, which I had I had nothing. So I used like family vacation <laughs> footage in like an iMovie trailer template. It was the worst thing ever. So <laughs> oh, no. I didn't get into any universities. <laughs> I didn't get a single acceptance. And then I forget how we found out about Metalworks, but um, I ended up getting into Metalworks, which I'm pretty sure if you can pay, anybody gets in. No shade to Metalworks. <laughs> oh, but, there you go. Um, I'm pretty sure you, you can you can get in. I think you just need an English credit. Yeah, and like yeah. A, maybe above sixty five average or something. So y- you didn't send in your Dutch mi- mixtape. I did not. I should have. <laughs> maybe I could have got a scholarship or something. Yeah. Could have mailed that CD in. Yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, do that. <laughs> but yeah, so then I moved to Mississauga. Yeah, which is like suburb heaven. I don't know if I would call it heaven, but um, lots of suburbs. Very different environment than than the countryside environment I was in. Sure. Michigan. But I was excited because I was 17 and living on my own with roommates for the first time. So I was like, we're having McDonald's every day. <laughs> I started making pasta, the same pasta, Classico jar, um, <laughs> which I'm sure people know. Oh, yeah. Uh, a university staple for it's me. It's a classic. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I, still, I still eat that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was. I was excited. I was really stoked. And I was, like, still doing the rapper thing. Um, and then I slowly wanted to start playing an instrument. And right. I fell in love with Jake Bug and like Ben Howard and James Bay, so I got an acoustic guitar and just completely changed my uh, my genre. I was like, Your I'm path. done. Yeah, I'm done rapping now. I'm a folk singer, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. I just woke up and I was like, I'm different. There you go. Yeah. Um. And you were saying before that that's where you met a lot of the like friends. That yeah, you that's now. where I met Mickey from Valley. Yeah. Who is we're roommates and besties, and so I met Richie, who I was in a duo with as well. Yeah. Um, went to the movies with him last night, actually, so. Oh. Still besties. Fantastic. Um, 
And yeah, I think Rob was there for a bit too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Alex was also there, all from Valley. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's where I met a lot of my friends and kind of started to figure stuff out musically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from from that, for the, so for those who don't know, that was like more of like an audio tech sort yeah. of school. Yeah, I did like studio engineering and yeah. uh, music business, actually. There you go. Speaking, it keeps <laughs> coming back. See, they 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 go hand in hand. Yeah. Do you remember like some of the th- the first like the first things that they taught you like or some of the things that like y- that you'd still apply today to like um or the things that you think about like this week that was like oh I learned this at Metalworks you know <laughs> the one thing that always comes back is how to wrap an XLR yes which I don't know why I paid so much money to learn that but um. Every time I wrap an XLR, I think about Metalworks. <laughs> um, no, to be honest, like, I think we were, we went there at such a, like, time where things were really changing and going into streaming and, like, going into the era where you can make an album on your laptop. Yeah. Um, that we learned, like, SSL console signal flow and, like, patch bay and, like, all that kind of stuff. And I haven't touched it since I graduated. Like, I've never... I don't even think I've I've gone into studios, but I, they don't even have SSLs anymore. A lot of them, like, <laughs> yeah. they're just like you plug your laptop in. There's an interface and like some rack gear. Yeah. Um. But yeah, they taught the. I mean, hmm. How honest should we be? On yeah, this please. Podcast? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um. No, honestly, I think the relationships I got out of that school were the best thing I could have gotten. Yeah. Sure. You know, a lot of it nowadays, you can learn. If you're disciplined enough, you can learn it online. Yeah. Um, or doing internships. But honestly, I think unpaid internships are insane. I did a lot of them because I was able to. But I think it's not fair for a lot of people that might not be able to afford the free time yeah. to do unpaid internships. Um, uh, where am I going? <laughs> no, just like just Metalworks. What, what oh, it actually right. gave you. Yeah, I mean. To- I think the relationships and totally, the, yeah, yeah is what I, with the, my the one thing that I, that I do really appreciate from from going there. Yeah. Um. So let's say starting at, so after Metalworks, what were the first like few years after that like sort of a lot what, of what did those look like? A lot of retail and restaurant jobs. There you go. Yeah. Um, and just like figuring out, I think I've only started to kind of get into the professional realm of things for the last like year. And a half or so. Yeah, yeah. So for a long time, it was just, you know, working whatever jobs I could to pay rent um, and doing music the rest of the time. So, yeah, yeah. And I think it took me a while to figure out my sound and like figure out what kind of music I wanted to make. Also, just a lot of, which in retrospect was good, like just a lot of honing my craft and like sitting in a bedroom and just making beats every day and not really emailing anyone or networking. I was just so focused on making stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. Which was great because I don't think the stuff was good enough to be sending to anyone yet. So I kind of, I'm glad that I kind of uh, hibernated for that period of time. But yeah, it was a lot of, I worked at like Frank and Oak, the clothing store yeah. with Richie um, and did a lot of like service jobs. I did a lot of random things like worked at you know the ping pong bar spin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I picked up ping pong balls for a living, which okay, is, wow. It was uh, I mean, yeah, it was it was a uh, character building. Yeah, I had to get your good shoes on. It was <laughs> fine, you know. Honestly, my favorite was Sundays because they had the professional ping pongers or like Whoa. the league ping pong yeah, league. Sure, sure, sure. And they were the nicest guys ever, and they like really appreciated the craft of picking up ping pong balls and filling their basket for them. But the worst was always the like. 1 a.m. like drunk party people. Yes. Yeah. Um, like I had people look at me straight and be like, "You must hate your life right now." And I was like, "We don't gotta say it like that." <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a humbling experience. Yeah. I worked at like a fancy restaurant called Canoe as like a server yes. assistant. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just whatever paid the rent. I did some live like music jobs as well. So I worked um uh, for like a live production company. Yeah setting up like festivals and like cables that were like s- this thick and it was just like it was like you were in the trenches I yeah think. like it was <laughs> very much so. it was grueling work but also good learning experience because it taught me that i didn't want to work in the live like 
live sound thing. Yeah, yeah. On totally. that scale, at least. Because mm-hmm. um, it's just, well, I mean, I'm sure you know, because touring. Yeah. It's just so much work. So <laughs> No, it is. I was it's like, like 14 uh, hour days, 16 hour days. Yeah, it's a lot. So I was like, okay, I didn't want to do that. I work, I still work with a company called Bella Sound um, that do like DJ stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just a lot of gigs and random things to yeah, yeah. Uh, to fund the music dream. And I would just pour all the money back into, I mean, living expenses and making music. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the, do you have some like lessons or things that you like, you know, um, that, that you t- you still take from those experiences, even like, like gigging and like, cause what I'm, what I'm thinking about right now is like those, those people who are still in that position yeah. listening. Yeah. Um, are there some things that, you know, that you still carry with you from that time where you were working, not necessarily in the industry, but still mm-hmm. pursuing that. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're going to do music and really want to do it, you have to like really love it. Yeah. Because there's going to be so many years where you're going to have to work that job that you don't really want to work and where people, when they hear that you do music, they don't take you serious because they're like, oh, he's just doing his little music thing. Yeah. Which is a classic, but... I think if you truly, truly love it, then you'll you're, you'll be willing to put up with those jobs in order to continue chasing um, your music dream. So I think if anyone's in that situation, keep going. Um, spend as much time as possible just getting good at your craft, networking, trying to reach out to people, even if it's just for a coffee, just a chat. Most people are down. Um, and just learning as much as you can, soaking up as much information. And... Um, appreciate you know the position you're in because i'm sure once you make it somewhere there's gonna be other worries and you're gonna be stressed about other things and you know i think if you can find joy in the grind and what you're doing on a day-to-day basis then that's all you'll really need but that's my (laughs) advice jeez Jeez. we can wrap it up right there right (laughs) see you guys (laughs) um just wanted to move on to sort of um now going into more of that professional sort mm-hmm. of industry that you, as you've been saying yeah um what are some of the things that you thought you knew but you but turns out it was completely different Ooh, uh i knew everything from the start so the perfect there's yeah, nothing okay. there's nothing <laughs> no i mean yeah. honestly so much i feel yeah. like um i always i don't know it it i didn't really think i knew anything but also for example, like writing sessions and stuff, I think the more I did them, I was like, oh, this is actually really chill. I used to think it was like right, super serious, which like at a professional level, yeah, you do want to be serious. You want to get into a room and you want to sit down and like leave with a song at the end of the session and not take eight hours because I initially would sometimes work on a beat for eight hours straight and that's just not very productive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I used to think it was just like big serious thing and like, piano or like there'd be one producer and one engineer and then two writers and it was just this really serious thing but it's kind of what i've learned at least in my experience is just a bunch of people who love making songs hanging out trying to make a song and yeah. it's a lot more relaxed than i thought it was i thought studio i thought writing sessions and writing camps would be like a lot more i don't know rigorous and serious and maybe they are maybe I haven't been in those ones yet but um it's pretty chill i think everybody that wants to do this and that's gotten to a point where it's almost professional. They've like paid their dues and they just enjoy the process and love being yeah. in the room together. So yeah, I think the, uh, the, f- the, how fun it is to write professionally is what I didn't expect, but what I learned, I guess. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Um, for, well, I mean, from, from, from I've been involved in, in, in the, in the circle in your specific, your, your yeah. circle for, for a couple of years now. Um, very exclusive. I, that, inner, inner circle. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, but f- from my experience, there's a lot of like communal writing, um, yeah. and a lot of like friends getting together, um, totally. and and growing their like their experience and their por- portfolio together, like yeah. f- friends writing together. Um, obviously, there's so many pros to to, to that. Definitely. Um, I'm gonna ask: Are there cons to it? Ooh, T. It's a little tea. It's a, it's a little Honestly, uh, I um I think I'm lucky enough that all my friends are very level-headed and honest and we're all very straight up with each other. Yeah. Um that 
it's just been I don't I haven't really experienced any cons. I think the con that I could see happening is usually, you know, they say friends and business don't mix. So when it comes to talking about splits or like producer sure, fees sure, and sure. stuff, I think that's where it could get complicated. But fortunately for the circle that I'm in, it's been it's been great. I mean, also I'm I don't have a manager, so I'll for negotiations or splits and stuff like that, I end up talking to their managers instead of them directly. So it's it's a little bit like separated from the friendship, which is I think healthy. Yeah. And I think once I have a manager, I'm sure the conversation will be just between managers and the friends can just make a song and then the rest gets figured out by by the managers. So I mean I'm really lucky that all my friends are super cool and <laughs> yeah. we're just chill like that. There you go. Um no cons, yeah. yeah. No. It's Yay all, friends. All pros. There you go. Um and I wanted to specifically talk to you as well about your experience over the past couple of years going from the accents mm-hmm. uh, to now your solo career. Can, just generally, can yeah. you talk to us about your experience there, totally. that whole thing? Because, there might again, there might be some people thinking about going this solo artist route. Yeah, for and sure. I just want to talk to you briefly yeah. about that. I mean, I, think, like, I feel like I've always kind of been not f- flopping around sounds, uh, it's not a great word, but I was in... I, did the solo thing in high school. It was like yes. the rapping thing. Then I was in a band. And then I did the solo thing again. And then I was in the duo. So I think I've always been kind of going back and forth. So who's to say I'm not going to be in a band next year. But <laughs> there you go. Um, no, I kind of wanted to, you know, do the solo thing again after I had learned so much and kind of developed a sound a little bit. Yeah. Um. So I just, yeah, I guess I just st- decided that I would like to do the solo thing. And Richie and I are still super close, still make music together. He's still producing. Um, but, I, yeah, I just want to try the solo thing again. I wanted to do, like, the indie pop solo artist thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And try it out. And that's it. It's also, I think, being in a band nowadays is incredibly difficult because it's so expensive to be in a band, make enough money to support all the members of the band, the touring costs more. It's totally. a lot more expensive. I think it's just in this day and age, it's pretty efficient to be a solo act because you can work with your friends regardless. Like, you don't technically need to be in the same band or in the same unit. You can still collaborate anyway. Um, yeah, it's great. So I think it's, yeah, I enjoy it. I like being a, a lone wolf. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do you think Do you think that your decision was influenced by, like, the, the writing camps that you were doing and, like, all that stuff? Like, do you think it was more, like a mental state of being, okay, I can do this on my my own. And did it change, like, your I think it, perception of it? It's a little bit easier as a solo artist yeah. to get into rooms and stuff. Of course, yeah, sure. Um, especially as a songwriter-producer thing. Um, I think it, it makes it a little bit easier because it's one person. And those two people could still collaborate after the fact, but it makes it a little bit easier to get invited or go out to places. And it also, I think... To my own detriment, I'm a bit of a control freak sometimes, especially yep. when it comes to my own music, that I find it hard to collaborate, even though I love collab. This is, it's weird. It's a very contradicting statement, actually, because <laughs> I love collaborating with other artists and writing for them. And I'm great in that sense, I think, because I know it's not my project. And I don't, I can't go in there and be like, we need to do it like this. Like, I'm just here to suggest ideas. Um, but for my solo stuff, I kind of just, I like doing the thing myself while collaborating with my friends and having their input, but I still get final say, which is, you know, a little bit control freaky, but it's, uh, it's been going okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And just last to close this topic out here, any tips? And I know, I know we just spoke to some yeah. tips, but any tips for people who want to get into maybe even the solo thing or even just pushing themselves to, yeah, to, to do the solo thing. Yeah. I mean, um, I think if you're, stoked on the music you're making i think craft really good demos and just tease it on tiktok or even you know share it with your friends or even just go ahead and release it i feel like there's a lot there's less pressure nowadays about releasing songs because so many are released yes that i think you can af- we have the ability to afford just kind of releasing stuff and seeing where it goes seeing what happens and there's not you can always take stuff down if you wanted to um so I think just experiment and try things and see what works. Yeah. I think it's there's less pressure to like Can they hear that? The oh sounds. yeah. Um 
there's less pressure to like my first single has to be the biggest thing ever. Yeah, like yeah, I yeah. think you can release probably 14 singles before one of them does really well or something. So yeah, I'd say just experiment and get out there and, and uh, get out of your comfort zone. I've realized is a big thing because that's where you do the most growing. <laughs> hey everybody, we're back <laughs> with uh, Matthias the Fourth here. Uh, I have a hat on now. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I want a wardrobe change. There you go. I'll roll my sleeve up. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we're it's it's the uh, it's forty sixth episode. Um, again, thanks for everybody who's listening. Thanks to everybody who's listening. Um, we're here talking about now um, writing because um, I mean that's so the thing that you've been doing the most over yeah, the past year. Um, sure. I say here, and I written, uh, I wrote it out here to not uh, fumble my words, as I have been over the past uh, <laughs> 30 seconds, but I say over the past couple years now, we've gotten to know you as Matthias the Ford, the artist, but there's also this whole other side of you that's been taking a lot of time in your schedule, and that's writing with other people on their projects. Mm-hmm. Most notably, uh, Valley. Yes. Elio. Yes. Um, and others. Yeah. Um, now I want to ask you specifically about your role in that process because not a lot of people are probably exposed to sort of that yeah. on their Instagram sh- yeah, or true. Their, their, their socials. Um, I mean, they probably see it, yeah. but they might not be aware of that role. For sure. Um, so how are you living in that space and how are you approaching those opportunities? Yeah, I mean, um, I've been working with them mainly as just a writer. Yeah. Um, because they are incredibly talented and Mickey does for Valley, especially Mickey, Rob. I mean, they all produce, so there's not really need for me to produce. I feel like they have their sound down. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's a band and it's a band. So it's like, yeah, but, um, yeah, I've been doing mainly just writing. Um, so I'll just come into the session, especially with Elio, there will be a producer and maybe another writer. Um, and then her and I, and I've just been kind of helping with lyrics, some melodies. Uh, I really enjoy lyrics, uh, the lyric aspect of it. I love coming up with titles and concepts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing that, and I'm lucky enough that, you know, they were my friends first and were willing to kind of give me a shot and invite me into some rooms. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up, uh, it ended up working out. We actually had a lot of fun and wrote some songs that are listenable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Some of my favorite songs on both the Valley record and some of the Elio stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm excited kudos. for uh, the new Elio yes. album. There you go. Coming sometime next year. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess, how do you, how are you approached in the beginning? Were you open to, to it? Um, like, I guess, yeah. How, how did yeah. you start like going into rooms? Um, I think it initially, I think Elliot was the first person who was like, hey, we should do some sessions and write together. Yeah. Because she'd heard like my solo stuff um, and we'd gotten to know each other through Mickey. Um, so I think we did, I think the first, I mean, we did a few sessions like a couple of years ago as the accents, but we did more like production kind of things. And it was like in the very early days of Elio. Um, and then later on, once Elio was really Elio, um, we did a session with DCF, who, I don't know if you'll hear this, but we all love DCF. He's an amazing writer. Um, he's also written a lot of Elio stuff. Um, but we did a session with DCF, and that ended up being Accidental Icon. Yeah. Um, and we wrote another song that is somewhere in the vault. Um, but yeah, it just started with one session, and we wrote a song, and the vibe was right. We just get along. Uh, and feel comfortable. I think a big thing about songwriting is feeling comfortable in the room because it's a very intimate experience to pour your heart out. Totally. Or sometimes just make a banger. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think the most important, the, the best songs happen in rooms where everyone's comfortable and excited. And I think being friends helped a lot. So being being in a room with your friends, I think makes it a lot easier to say your ideas and suggest concepts or... yeah do melodies because I think what I've noticed doing sessions with other people, it's a little bit scarier to sing melodies out loud or like say, what about this to people you've never met? Yeah. yeah, You don't know how they're going to respond. So I think cutting my teeth in the room with friends was really good because it allowed me to not only get better as a writer, 
um, but also just kind of see what the songwriting process is like with artists and stuff. Um, and yeah, I've just, I've been lucky enough to be in rooms with them and they've invited me into rooms with other producers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Can you take us through a process of, of what that looks like? Uh, yeah. In, in the room. I mean, one of the highlights, I guess, is the song called Break For You by Valley mm-hmm. was when we were in L.A. Um, they had a session with a producer writer named Peter Fenn and a producer, David Pramick, who are like, they're doing amazing. Um, I'm sure if you look them up, you'll see some songs you've heard. Uh, and they were doing a session with them. And then Mickey and Rob were like, do you want to come? And I was like, I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> and I was super nervous because I was like my first big LA session and like yeah. you know I like looked up Peter Fenn and David Pramick beforehand and I was like oh it's like serious <laughs> so I was like kind of nervous because I was like oh god like I don't even know if I'm cut out for this or like if I'm gonna be able to say my ideas and I was like pretty intimidated it was at this really cool house called Mega House which is like a writer producer management company um they have this beautiful like mid-century LA home with studios in it is this the all the pictures that yeah were, they're taken there like, With like the, yeah the carpet and the nice yeah the really cool room yeah, yeah yeah so it was there so like the whole experience was just like whoa yeah and then once we got into the session um i just felt comfortable right away like peter and david were super chill and i was with rob and mickey who are close friends so i was like i felt very comfortable and right away i was able to be a part of the process and not be shy of suggesting ideas or lyrics and stuff so right um and that's when I kind of realized, like, oh, even at the professional level, it's just like making a song with your friends right. at any level. So learning that is uh, has been great. So now I kind of excuse me. Woo. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> well, just like taking us through that process. Oh, yes, but, the process. But, yeah. But to touch on something that you were saying is that like the people that are successful, and it goes through all the roles, most mm-hmm. of the roles in the industry. It's like the people who are successful are make other people comfortable. Yeah. And totally. and and sort of are friends with it. even the new yeah. people that they meet and and for it's sure. like comfortability and just professionalism. Through, yeah. Through that. So no, for sure. I'm glad that these people were also like. Yeah, no, it was welcoming, great. and it was yeah. very like eye opening that you know even at one of the higher levels in LA that it was still a chill environment. And yes. It wasn't like no, that idea sucks. Who's got a better one? Like it was <laughs> very like every, we're all together like trying to make a good song. Totally. And that's kind of this. It's a similar process for every session, but also different for every session. But basically, you come in, and depending on who it's for, if it's for pitch or a specific artist, you kind of usually you chat for like half an hour to an hour just you know, to break the ice like we did here. We had a whole conversation before the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you just chat with each other, kind of see where everyone's at in their life. And then you kind of start talking about, for example, if you're working with a specific artist, you talk about what they're working on, if they're working on a project or if they're working on singles or what the vibe is, what they're inspired by, mm-hmm. anything that's going on in their personal life. And you kind of go from there. Like sometimes, like most times you'll start with, some, someone can come in with a full concept or sometimes you just start playing with a loop or guitar chords or piano chords, whatever. And you kind of just start throwing paint at the wall. Yeah. And then there's also cases where an artist could come in with like a full hook and you're just trying to figure out verses. Right. Um, so it varies, but it also is kind of a similar process each time. Yeah. Um, are there techniques that, you, that are used? Like specifically, like do you have like things that you're like, okay, well, this this didn't work last time, so we're not going to do it. And, um, or do you have like specific things that you go back to, sort of like? One thing that actually that I learned that's really cool is if you're getting kind of stuck at a certain point in the writing process, sometimes pitching the key of the song can help. So if you go up a couple of semitones or down a couple of semitones, yeah. it can unlock new melodies and kind of just change the vibe. Because sometimes if you're hearing the same loop over and over you can kind of get stuck in it and kind of like box yourself in. So I find changing the key uh, has been very helpful yeah, as far as fantastic. like techniques for, for yeah, writing songs. Yeah. But, yeah. Any other things that um, the, like, let's say you're, you're entering a room. Are there things that you see that are like, ah, that's, or, or this today will be fun because it's it, because of this or, or today won't be as fun as yesterday because it's right. like something has happened or, um, I mean, environment definitely plays a role. Like yeah. sometimes when you walk into the room, like for example, the Break Free session, I walked into the studio and I was like, whoa, this is so cool. And right. 
that enough was already like I was already stoked. Um, but then there's some sessions where you walk into the room and you're like, ooh, like not really, but like it's all gray and there's just a USB cable and some speakers. Yeah. But even then, there's been good results. So it like definitely affects the writing process a little bit, but also I think the environment only has a small amount of impact because as long as you're focusing on the writing and the song itself, yeah. you kind of zone in on it. Um, but I think also gear. As, yes, a, as yeah. like a producer, sometimes you walk into a room and you see a bunch of cool synths that can be inspiring or impactful yeah, yeah, and yeah. exciting because you're like, oh my God, let's try that. And that can also lead to a starting a song idea because you're like, I've been wanting to try this synth. Totally. Um, and then also sometimes, you know, if things aren't going well, sometimes you just grab a guitar and you leave the room and go sit outside and write right. on guitar. So um, that's... Yeah. What, yeah so, is, what's impactful when you walk into a... Yeah, like, are, are, are there things like, yeah, I was going to lead to, like, maybe, like, an acoustic piano right. or, like, things like that? Like, are there yeah. things, like, in the room that sometimes totally. change, like, the mood of the day? Kind definitely, of thing? Yeah. definitely. Yeah, I think subconsciously it has a big impact, but also, you know, on the surface level, if I see, like, a really cool synth, then I get stoked. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And if there's no synth, then I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're going to go on Splice today, which is fine. So yes, it definitely yeah. dictates a little bit of the direction. Totally. Um, but, yeah. Fantastic. You, you've been talking about these things, um, like these like sort of like writing camps or mm -hmm. sorry, writing days where people get together to write. Mm -hmm. um, before I got involved in like this English, even just pop world, yeah, it, it hasn't been a thing. Right. Um, that it sort of blew my mind when I started working with, with, with Charlotte yeah. and Elio because I was like, oh, this is how people do it. People go yeah. to L.A., uh, sometimes with their friends, yeah. like maybe the Big Bear camp, like y'all yeah, did. Yeah, totally. Uh, and it's like it, it's like a f like for me, it was like a phenomenon. Like I, I'd right. never heard about this, and this is how people do it. It sort of blew my mind. Yeah. Um. Yes, like writing retreats and camps are, are a thing, but mm -hmm. also like the process that you're talking about currently with yeah. having multiple writers, producers, and, and the yeah, artists in totally. one room is a thing. Um. I just wanted to shine a light at it, but I don't know if I have necessarily a question. I in my in my notes here I said, "Can you yeah. share about this? We've been talking sure. about it." But was it was it like surprising for you as well? Um, I had I think because I was kind of in the producing songwriter thing, I'd yeah. known about writing camps, but I never did one until Elio invited me to the Big Bear one. Yeah, um, and that was just super cool because I was like, "Oh my god, we get to like travel to LA and then drive into the mountains and just be in a house with people." And make music like that's it's like the best summer camp ever yeah yeah um and it's i think it's i love camps because you kind of get into your own little world with these people that you're there with yeah yeah, yeah. and kind of the only thing that matters is the music you're making in that moment and in that place um like for the valley album they had a camp at a house it was this really old 70s house i don't know if we started calling it the a-frame but it was like we called it the A-frame, and it was like a house that's in the shape of a of an A-frame. Right. Um, and it was right underneath the Hollywood sign, and it was very far. Like in L.A., there's so much to do and so many restaurants, so many distractions. that, But it was far enough up the hill that it wasn't really worth going out because it was just a mission. Right. So we were just in this house for a week straight, and it was like the best time ever because it was just a bunch of cool people in this house with a bunch of history with a view, and you just wake up every day, and you get to make songs, which is like... That's the best thing ever. That's all. What all we want to do is make songs. So I think, I think writing camps are great. I think sessions are great if you're just trying to hone your craft and 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 build your skills and stuff. Doing sessions every day is crucial. But I think camps are probably some of the places where the best music gets made because sometimes it takes a few days to get into a rhythm with right. people and to get comfortable. And when, and when you're doing one-off sessions, you can't. You don't necessarily have the time to do that. Whereas camps, you kind of it's like a little bit of camaraderie. Like you're all in this place together and the only goal is to work on this album or project. And I love that. It's also, you also have to like, you're not making music 24 seven. I'm sure some camps maybe do that, but for the Valley camp, it was great. We like would wake up in the morning, have coffee, chat, listen to music. And then we start writing around 1 PM and it was a mix of different producers and writers every day. So yeah. we put names in a hat and you pull out, you know, a name for a writer, and that goes in the A room. And then we had three different rooms. So the main living room was a studio. There's a bedroom that was a studio, and there's this little outside studio terrace thing. 
And so each day there would be just a different combination of people. And it's just really cool to see what comes out of that because it's, you don't really know what's going to happen when you put this producer with this writer. Right. And then at the end of the day, we would all play each other what we'd made. And it's just like, it was just super fun. And it was like this friendly competitiveness because you can hear, you know, the the song coming from the other room. You're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds really good. Like we really <laughs> got to step up our game in this room. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, I think it's great. Yeah, I love how, camps. How many people were, were at the A-frame? Uh, there's the band and then me and then I think... I mean, each day there's different producers coming through. Right. I feel like okay, okay, okay. any given day there's like 10 to 12 people-ish. Okay. Like three or four in each room. Right. So maybe almost 16 some days. But yeah, it was uh, it was a hustle and bustle of people. But there's like obviously the band. Yeah. And then because I don't like a lot of the producers and writers that came through lived in L.A. So they would come for the day. You're right. And then head out. But because I don't yeah, live in yeah. L.A., I also stayed there with the band, which is super great. And they're all friends and stuff. Like yeah, it so it was sense. very. It was it was just like a little, a little getaway, a little camp. Yeah, and then that's um, you know, watch movies after we wrote songs and just kind of hung out and got a little high sometimes and just lived the uh, the A frame life. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and f- like, is there an average of like, okay, let's say you were there for a week. Mm-hmm. They put they just put out the record. Yeah. Like. How many songs, let's say, in a week? Would you? Is there an average? Is is it sort of dumb to say, oh, well, it's like a song a day, or? Um, I think. I mean, it depends on the. I feel like the chemistry at the camp. Yeah. Um, but I think, especially with the three different rooms, there was at least three songs happening every day. Yeah. For a week straight, and maybe sometimes a song wouldn't be fully completed, but they were fleshed out enough ideas that it was. It, it you can consider it a song. So, I mean, three times. Seven, math. Yeah, like 21. 21. 21. Yeah. <laughs> Can you do something for me? Um, yeah, so like a f- like probably like a good album's worth of material. And they had already, Valley had already written a bunch of stuff for the album. They technically, right. I think, already had the album. But then they were like, mm, we want to have some more songs. And so then they did the camp and that ended up just, I think the, the chemistry between all the people that were there was just so great that a lot of the songs from the camp made it onto the album. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. yeah. There's some things from the camp. That yeah, I think all, like h- half of the album, I think, was done at wow, the, okay. the house. Because I think it's just a really good vibe, and I think the best music just gets made when people click. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think it's yeah. just kind of, uh, yeah, there's some magic in that house. Fantastic. It was, it was fun. I'm just surprised personally because I know how how, how sort of fast that turn turnover must have been. Totally. Because... Because wasn't that this summer, the A-frame? No, it was, uh, the album came out in June, but the camp was in, I think, November. The, oh, okay. The year prior. Yeah, yeah, so okay, there's like okay. six oh, okay, okay. But still, okay. for an album, it was like crunched. It was quick. Like, I know Mickey was like, had a lot of laptop work to do after that camp. Sure, to like, sure. You know, get sure. get all the songs done and mix prepped. And okay. I know they worked a lot in Toronto after the camp to like yes. finish the demos and stuff. Because some songs at the camp would be, like maybe eighty percent done, but then there's a lot of stuff that's like it's just a demo. So they would yeah. take it after the camp and then work on it. So they had a a good chunk of material to kind of sift through and polish up. Um, totally, yeah, fantastic. Sorry, I thought it was my 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 timeline's off. Oh but, yeah, but like, still six months is. We were live streaming the album to Spotify <laughs> yeah, as we were yeah. making it. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Um, now can I ask you how these experiences have shaped your soul? So, so, Solo career. Yeah. Um, I realized that I am much better at making music with other people than by myself. Sure. Um, I think the last year or so I've realized how much I love collaborating. Yeah. And I think that's where I get most of my joy from. I never, like, saw myself as an extrovert, but I think I am because I really get energy from being with other people. Yeah. So nothing gets me more hyped than being in a room with other people who also want to make a good song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've realized collaboration is kind of like the backbone of my musical career. I think I just like I'll have ideas by myself and I'll write alone and like produce stuff alone and like make beats alone. I like doing that. But when it comes to writing songs, I really like having other people in the room and like bouncing ideas off each other mm-hmm. and feeding off each other, each other's energy. So, yeah, I guess I learned that I love the collaborative process is like the main thing I took away from it and like will be applying that to my solo stuff as well. Like I hope that I can do a camp for my solo stuff eventually. Yeah, I would yeah, love yeah. to do that. Um 
and yeah, just working with people that are equally passionate. I think that's also, it also really helps with getting better at your craft. I think when you're in a room by yourself, it's great. You can learn a lot, but you learn way faster and way more when you're with other people because you'll see a producer do something a certain way and you're like, oh my God, I've never thought about it that way. Right, yeah, yeah. And like there's stuff you can learn on YouTube, but I feel like there's also so much noise on YouTube. There's one dude telling you to boost all your EQs and there's one dude that only subtracts EQs. Yeah. And like, it's just like, you don't really know what's right. So I think being in the room and hearing what they're doing and seeing it happen live yes, is, is a great way to learn. And I think I've grown a lot just in the past year alone by being surrounded by other creatives and like, seeing how they do things and, and learning from that. So, yeah, that's another piece of advice is collaborate. <laughs> Unless, I mean, there's some people that are just fully solo and they are phenomenal. Yes. I'm just not one of those people, unfortunately. That's that's all right. Yeah. Um, are there things that you're looking forward to at the moment? Are there, th and, and I also don't want to like push you to sort of share anything. That oh yeah, yet leak all the details. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But are there things that you're looking forward to? It could also be, you know, very vague, yeah. but uh, yeah. There's this album. No. Um, <laughs> what I'm looking forward to is, I think, just honestly making a living off music yeah. and paying my rent with it. I, I'm i like, I'm still full transparency, not there yet, even with like all the stuff I've been doing the last year or so. It also, if you have a song come out, it takes like nine months for, you know, any royalties or anything like that to come through. So. I'm still at a point where I'm doing work on the side, like I'm doing some film editing and stuff, yeah. um, doing a lot of part-time stuff just to be able to fund rent in Toronto and be able to go to LA. So I'm excited to finally, you know, consider music my full-time job. Yeah. Which hopefully will be sometime next year. Yeah. I'm hoping. Um, Definitely. But yeah, that's what I'm most looking forward to. It's like so close. It's that That's the tricky balance too, I think. Because when I was not doing music professionally, I... I had a lot of time to just work my part-time jobs. Whereas now I find I'm getting busier and busier with music, but I also still need to pay my rent and make money. And as a songwriter, you don't see any income from the songs you do until they're released and then perform well. And then months later, right. yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. gets collected. So it's a lot of like future earnings. Yeah. Even and if you're producing a banger in uh, January, you yeah. won't see it until. Yeah. I mean, for like producing, it's a little bit better because you can get like, an upfront fee or a half upfront, yeah. and then when the song is released, you get your full fee. Um, but as a songwriter, that's not the case. Yes, yeah. Um, so I think the tricky balance for me now is that I'm, I'm doing music in a full time capacity, but I also need to find time to like make money right now to pay my rent. Right now, while also maintaining yeah. the momentum that I have right now, because I don't want to like you know I can't go apply for a full time job and then not go to LA for a month or tell them like, Hey, I'm going to go to LA for a month. Like I'm not going to, they're not going to hire me. Yeah. So it's a lot of, it's a bit stressful sometimes like searching around for income. Um, but it's heading in the right direction and mm -hmm. I'm, uh, yeah, I look forward to, uh, paying my rent with music money. <laughs> <laughs> past, past that. Um, what's the dream? Very general question. The dream. Yeah. What, what, We're what living is, it right now. There baby. you go. <laughs> No. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> this is the dream. Honestly, being on a podcast was my dream. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It. It, was, it was high on the checklist of side quests that I've been wanting to complete, <laughs> so I'm, I'm thankful for you having me. Fantastic. But the dream, honestly, I think would be to have the freedom to make music every day and move around to whichever location I want to make music in. Mm. So I think, you know, working with artists in London – would be sick and then if i want to go to la i can just go to la i think having that freedom to not really have to be tied down anywhere would be amazing and i think that's the dream also would love to do a solo tour one day yeah um that's the dream i guess and like maybe selling out a show would be the dream yeah yeah but i think i'm really enjoying the songwriter producer thing now so i'm kind of leaning into that more um, which kind of narrows the chances of the solo sold out tour thing, but who knows where things will go next year, you know? Yeah. And so many, so many artists now as well were first writers yeah, totally. or, or not necessarily first and well, second or yeah, but, but first saw success. In that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you had to read, this is a last question here before we go into the producer's game, but, Ooh. um, if you had to restart your journey with the knowledge that you have now, 
what would you what would you do differently except not go to metalworks but what would you <laughs> <laughs> what would you do differently uh what would i do differently i think i would have maybe from the start been a bit more thorough in my time management sure and like allocating my time to things that were moving me forward and not doing things for the sake of being busy cuz you can make beats 24/7 a day but if you're not networking or or building relationships to get those beats placed anywhere, yeah, those 24 hours don't really mean much. I think it's great to hone your craft in the beginning, but I think if I were to start over, I would be a bit more focused on the music business to to tie it all back to the <laughs> beginning. Um, yeah, I would be a bit like make make a bit more like actual plans and set some goals instead of just kind of, you know flying by the seat of your pants and yeah. making music every day and hoping for the best. I think you have to be somewhat smart with your time, especially nowadays. I think there's so much to do as a as a writer, producer, artist. You have to wear so many hats. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm just repeating the same answer over and over. I feel no, like no, no, no. But it, um, yeah, time management. It's important. I, I would yeah. focus my time more accurately on, on things that I know are getting me further in my career. Yeah. Ty's, Ty's a stoke for the uh, for the for the scratch back in. Um, can I, can we scratch one more time? Yeah. Sick. <laughs> um, we're back. Uh, last segment of the forty uh, sixth episode of the Club Machine Podcast with Matthias. Um the fourth. Yeah. Um, we're here on the producers game. For those who don't know what the producers game is, is a chance for me and for yourselves. To know more about sort of maybe the influences yeah. of uh, of of the artist uh, or or the sorry the guest on the on the podcast um, for the producer producers game specifically I asked the guest Tice um, about their dream album. Now, as an artist, it doesn't necessarily need to be their album, um, but I asked them a dream album, dead or alive, mm-hmm. for, for people. Yeah, it's um, who would be the artist or artists on on the album. The producers, the writers, that that's a specific question for, for sure for the for Matthias here. The writers, the themes of the album, so what what the album would touch on, the studio, and the city. So the studio doesn't necessarily need to be in the city uh, that it, it's originally in, and the era. Uh, uh, so when when would have when would this album come out? And it right. can come out like in the eighties or something. Right. So uh, let's get started. A on the uh, producers game, it's yeah, a loaded question. Loaded, very. How very, many people uh, have picked the nine seventy five as artist on, um, on this podcast so far? Maybe about like maybe three. Okay, out of forty six, which is not that That's much. It's not terrible. <laughs> I feel like there's multiple because as soon as I decide the artist, I think it's gonna it's gonna decide other things. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. <sighs> so. He told me to think about this before we started recording. I was like, "No, nah, I'm gonna do it on the spot," <laughs> and now I'm here on the spot. We we can we can go we can go um in not in in that order as okay. well. We can start with um okay. Like, let's do era because okay. just because right now I'm really into like new wave and post punk. Sure, like a flock of seagulls and like new order, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think was like like seventies, eighties. Yeah, should have done more research. <laughs> That era. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the city. See, it's tough because the city, I feel like we need to be in England somewhere to 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 really get that era down. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's go to, let's go to, okay, let's combine studio because Sh- Shangri-La. Okay, we're going to Shangri-La. Just because I like Malibu and the beach is just, uh, but you're not going to get a good post-punk but, sound out of Malibu. That doesn't make any sense. But, but, but again, you can bring Shangri-La. To, to Manchester. To Manchester, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be cold. I feel like they don't have heating in that <laughs> studio. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Mm. Yeah, enough joking around here. Yeah, what no. are we doing? We're burning time. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go with... Okay, no. Oh, I have an idea. You know what I think would be sick? A post-punk new wave album yeah. by, by Harry Styles. Okay. Fantastic. Because I feel like he's kind of doing the vintage sound a little bit. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And he's British, so I think it makes sense. <laughs> okay. 
producer, I mean, Kid Harpoon, but he's like producing, I mean, he's producing amazing stuff. He also produces all of Harry's stuff. So that's like, we're just making a Harry Styles album now. Um, No, no, no. Okay. A 1975. That's the artist, 1975. Okay. In, in the post-punk new wave era of the late 70s, early 80s. Fantastic. With Kid Harpoon. Whoa. As a producer. Yep. Maybe maybe Jack Antonoff shows up on a couple of the days, but not too much. We don't want yeah. we don't want him, we don't want him to do the whole album. Yeah, he's there. George Daniels, who's part of the Nine Seventy Five, but obviously, and then, um, you know, I honestly don't know who produced New Order Records. Was it the band themselves? Maybe I'm not sure. But it could be members of New Order that New, you get. Yeah, some members of New Order, um, writers. This is bad because I call myself a songwriter, but I don't know many songwriters by name. Ooh, Jake Torrey is doing cool things. He's written a lot of cool stuff. So maybe Jake Torrey. Okay. He's doing a lot of pop stuff right now. Ooh, French Shadow, Baby Girl. I think they're sick writers. They would be cool for a new wave album. This yeah. Is, this album's going to be the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Such a mess. Themes. Um, I think it would be themes of... Hopefulness, but also disparity because they're, bless you. Thank you. Themes of, yeah, like, because I feel like for post-punk, you need to be kind of depressed. Yeah. And and Matt Healy kind of is depressed in his songs a lot. So I think he's the right character to give a, yeah, let's let's do themes of longing and despair. But, but, but with hope at the end. With a little bit of hope. There's some, like, fun bops on there, like, <laughs> sure. you know. Studio. I don't know many good studios. What's like? I mean, Abbey Road. Yeah, that's a cliche. Uh, studio, studio, studio. Mm. It also doesn't necessarily need to be a studio. It could be like an environment. Oh, okay. Yeah, like uh, an estate, like a big villa or like a yeah. countryside. Yeah. And it's raining every day, so they can't <laughs> go outside. <laughs> So the it'll really play into the depressing theme of the music. But then there's a few sunny days, and that's when they make the singles. <laughs> city, no city, village. Yeah, yeah. We're thinking like English countryside. Yeah, like Worcester or something, which <laughs> yeah. not the sauce, the village. I don't even know if it's a village. <laughs> something by that name. Something, or like, Stir. yeah, like Gloucester. Like maybe we're in like North England, almost Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Vibe. There you go. And that would be the best album <laughs> ever released. <laughs> Fantastic. We uh that's how we conclude the Maybe it's released in twenty twenty three though. Perfect. No one's doing post punk new wave. Maybe people are and I don't know them. Well maybe that's 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 the, the defining the, album. The that sound the era the sonic era is new wave post punk, but the era it's released in is today. Fantastic. Thank you. That's how we conclude the ep <laughs> of the pod. Nice. Um, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me. It's, it was fun. It's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, and just to get to know a little bit of your influences as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially coming from uh, Netherlands and, yeah, and, and how, sure. how that sort of played a part uh, growing up in a rural rural uh, sort of spot. Yeah. Like myself. Yeah. And um, country and boys. Country boy. Doing the country city thing. Country boy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the whole writers thing, I we haven't written necessarily had like a writer or yeah. something. Yeah, like on the pod, it's Sick. great to talk about that whole thing. And honestly, the whole like writing camp thing is like sort of blow, like blown my mind over the past yeah, couple years. For sure. Um, and uh, just talk about it. it's been fun. It's fun. Thanks for those who've been listening to the pod. Uh, again, the forty sixth episode. I'm still sort of mind blown. We've been going for forty six yeah. weeks straight. Scraping um, the barrel with people to have on now. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, and uh, yeah, but again, thanks, thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks for fulfilling my podcast dream. <laughs> of course. Uh, thanks for the people who are listening. Please, it's a little cliche to say all the time, but if if you like the the pod, uh, subscribe, like, comment, do the whole thing. Uh, we, we're also on um, Eight's community. Uh, on Instagram and Eights Creative as well, which is our more of a, a professional page for clients and services and stuff like that. Um, but thanks again for listening, and we will see you next week. Any uh, any f any further um, comments? Yes. Thanks. That's all. <laughs> see you next week. Bye. <laughs>